Okay, thank you. Howdy, how are y'all? Good to see you. We've got a decent amount of people in the room, which is fantastic considering this is like the third or fourth time in this conference that this subject is being discussed, right? So, uh, my name is Garrett Seeley. I am a technical associate professor at the uh, Biological Equipment Technology at Texas State Technical College in Waco, Texas. Um, I have uh, got a master's in IT from the Bachelor of Science and uh, 25 or so years experience in the field. So, you know, this has been a passion of mine uh, for a while, and I really spent a lot of time studying um, how these things are set up, how these networks are set up, and most recently, how are people trying to affect it. So, uh, joining me today is actually Chris from Simile, right? Yes. We actually just met yesterday. Yes. Right? So, uh, Chris and I were actually discussing after the networking class uh, about a lot of this stuff for the cybersecurity and ransomware. I thought that you are actually a uh, a specialist in this here. I'm going to hand the mic off to you real quick and let you do an intro for yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm not going to call myself an expert. Uh, so, my name is Chris Magistrato. I'm a security researcher. I've been in information security, cybersecurity for the past five years. Most of, security most of the conferences I'm familiar with are actually security conferences, so I'm getting more into the medical field, understanding the different threats that are happening specifically here. So, as I take a look at all the threats, just in general and everywhere, learning more about this specific industry and how things are being targeted here is something that's new to me, but the threats are the same almost all other industries and looking at them looking at them here is very, very unique. So so how many years do you have in uh, cybersecurity just in, in general? I have five years. And uh, you've done uh, some some labs and some mock ups and I, I do labs for fun. So we're talking about passion, yeah. I like I like setting up my own types of things. So I just set up a computer and then Maybe I'll find an instance of uh, one of the many types of ransomwares, and then I'll affect my computer and see exactly how it um, it affects. Uh, some of them are sophisticated, some of them are really dumb, but uh, uh, all of them can be uh, mitigated. And you're involved in uh, reverse engineering. Yes, products. yes, reverse engineering some of the ransomware. I think I was I was on some flight to Europe for another security conference, and I took a part of it. I reverse engineered and saw how it was set up, and I was like, this is pretty basic, like, I mean, this thing actually did damage, and it's, it's incredible um, uh, how people can get away with this. Yeah. So I'll be uh, handing the mic back and forth to him when he uh, has uh, some content to bring, because there's just going to be some things that, uh, frankly, he's a little bit more uh, first on the mind. Uh, this is actually going to be a summary of a lot of the things that, uh, that I've been uh, studying and reading as well, and uh, some of the things that have been specifically inspired by the uh, AME uh, 2017 conference. Uh, and I'll tell you what, there's some good content in here. We tried uh, uh, pitching this, or I tried pitching this to uh, Baylor Health, and really liked it, sort of fleshed out into something that's very good and productive. So let's get into it. So, uh, you know, originally this was something that was specifically talking about the long cry of the effects that that virus had on medical devices, and then just sort of morphed into this uh, general uh, discussion of threats and threats and how it affects hospitals. It's very important that you understand some of the things that are in here. There's some great uh, references for you to follow up on. So, move along here. And where is my host? Anyway, okay, so this is off. I want to get that first production. You know, recording, right? Okay, there we go. Okay. Yay! Okay, so uh, just to talk about this, what we're going to try and do is we're trying to bring you up to speed on what things have happened, give you a breakdown on uh, how criminals use this to exploit hospitals, and, and frankly, they're starting to take money from them. So this is one of those things where it's a, it's a potential loss, and we're loss mitigators. So this is something we need to be aware of, right? Um, we want to talk about how they've infected machines, and then give you some course of actions, um, and pretty much uh, end up talking about risk management at some point in time. So, the big question is, why are people concerned about ransomware? Well, it has a lot to do with the effects that happened in uh, May of 2017, right before that conference. There was this big viral attack, WannaCry took out a lot of machines. This, if you cannot see, this is actually the screen on contrast media injector from NeverAdd. 
That was using uh, Windows XP, if I'm not mistaken, as an operating system. That uh, Windows XP has become infected with WannaCry. The uh, files for operation of this device are now encrypted, and you have to pay the ransom to get your device back. Right? Now, though that was not really a bad thing, any of you that are in the service know about I mean, there's not a lot of PHI on that, right? So, what we really need to do at that point is just wipe the hard drive and reload the software. But it did shut down the operation of the device. So, uh, this is a good example of one of those things that, that got a lot of attention. Specifically, it got the attention of Forbes. Now, a lot of your executives are reading Forbes, right? This scared the piss out of them. There's no other way to put it. So um, this got a lot of buzz really quickly, and it was put out uh, as a confirmed attack. So yeah, that scared me. So to compound the issue, um, Wired Magazine started talking about crypto loggers at the same time, and how hospitals were going to be the next target. So moving along, uh, that was inspired by this attack, where a hacker actually went into the financial records of Presbyterian in LA, got into the financial records, encrypted them, and then demanded $17,000 encrypted. That was a chunk change. What happened if they grabbed the you know, patient records? You know, now we're, we've got a HIPAA incident. Now we're in violation. Now, uh, I'll tell you, we were discussing, I think I said, this is shown change. This was a bad hack. It would have been a lot easier if we just gotten into the protected health information, encrypted that, and then threatened them with a report to the uh, federal government, unless you paid me, and I would put at least a couple of extra zeros in the back that in. Because there's really no difference between that felony and a uh, felony for 17 million, right? <laughs> So if you're going to if you're going to just wave the wave the flag, you might as well put it up there and wave it proudly. Yes, that's true. And one thing, at least in security, that I always say is like we're not going to be targeted. You know, people, you know, why would they target us? Hackers don't really care about who's security, right? So um, you know, everyone in this room, if you're on the network, is like, I don't, I'm not looking for one person. I'm just going to scan the entire network and see what's out there. So. Out of the couple hundred people that they'll be around, it's like if I got like 20 or even like five of them, that's I'm gonna auto infect you. It's not just like I'm going to yeah. you. So it's it's making sure that the the lowest hanging fruit on your network is not as bad as it. And, and we're gonna we're gonna get into addressing that low hanging fruit here very shortly. So uh, moving on, a lot of things at this point. Uh, what is ransomware? So there's a couple of different attacks that you need to be aware of. The first two are just going to knock out the system. And knocking out the system is bad enough. That can create a lot of havoc, especially if it is a server that goes down, uh, because now you've lost a major trunk of your network, right? So uh, the first thing is we'll, that will take out the master boot record. I think anyone who's gone through the Windows update and got a blue screen of death knows how vulnerable the master boot record is. You're laughing. You know, you're laughing, so it's actually happened. Did an update, and then all of a sudden, oh, the machine don't work anymore. Right? And now you have to do a rollback if you're lucky, <laughs> right? right? To repair that master group record. And that would be the easy and quick way to repair that. So, uh, other things, what you can do is you can take out the login. You can actually change permissions. Go in there and lock people out of their account or lock them out of certain things that they're going to hold them ransom for that. But that's really not going to interrupt a lot of your uh, access to the system. But really, it's a new technique that they've been using on a lot of the crypto lockers and those viruses that are designed that are similar to that. It's going after the files themselves. Going after sensitive files and locking them and not really interrupting the operation of the machine, but holding it ransom. And saying either you pay or you start losing personal information. Now, that's not a big deal to a person, I guess, if it's just pictures of the intrinsic value. But imagine the value there again of hospital information. And so this is where we're, we're starting to see more of a, uh, of a uh, uh, trend. And you know, the last line, I remember somebody told me that, uh, that we're, we're getting held up online now instead of on the screen. And uh, I think I even put that in there. So I found this graphic 
This graphic shows a trend. At first, what they were doing is using a lot of misleading ads. There was this, this little clip of, uh, of uh, uh, crypto blockage style uh, viruses, and then mostly they were just doing phishing attacks. We all are used to phishing attacks. Don't click on these unknown, un unsolicited emails. You've heard all this stuff, right? But now what they're starting to do is they're starting to use the native trick uh, equipments that are in, or the uh, they're using the native settings that are in Windows to try and populate viruses without your knowledge and of your intent. That's how uh, WannaCry really worked. So uh, let's talk about WannaCry. Why was that so bad? Well, on top of that thing, when NetRad lost those injectors, they did lose a couple of injectors, right? You know, but they were able to get their to reprogram and get them back to money. They were not as bad hit as the National Health Service of India. They had so many infected systems, they had to shut down whole hospitals. There were up to 70,000 devices affected. The entire health system of Britain had to take pause for a little bit. It fell on paper records because they had lost so many critical systems. That's a bad attack. And that happened in May, right before the AIM conference. So, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of people had questions about that, and even the people that presented and said, you know, look, we, we don't even have any information on this yet, right? So, uh, I don't know where, where you were at or if you heard of that, Chris, at that point in time. But, yeah, this this was another one of those scary things that compounded and disturbed a lot of people. So, uh, I want to talk briefly about one crime, which we didn't come on in. Um, WannaCry as a virus itself uh, basically would give you this splash screen and say, look, I've encrypted your files. You got seven days. I started deleting files at that point. Um, yeah, it used SMB. Here's where I'd really like to hand it over to you. Uh, SMB is WINS. Basically, it was using WINS protocol to pro populate itself from the machine to machine. Uh, you Give me some details. I'll just see if I can go back one slide. Oh, sure. So, I'll go back one slide. Um, if you can vaguely make out here, it says send three hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin to this address. Uh, previously, um, it used to just be that they would just spray and pray, like hackers would just say, "I'm gonna hack all the systems I can, get three hundred dollars out of it." Um, and as things got more sophisticated, they started realizing what systems and networks are actually getting into. So uh, once they, this, like you said, once you get into, oh, it's a hospital network, then they start knowing it and saying, oh, this information is worth more, so they'll charge more. Um, there was also a case, I guess which state it was, it was up north where uh, they actually got into the police department and set up ransomware and said that they, the police department had to pay because there was a lot of records that they could not use. Uh, so, yeah, so it does, this, oh, what's that say, the, the exploit vector for this, for one of these, one exploit vector for this type of attack is SMB. So, um, and you mentioned phishing emails. So, that's one way to get infected. But if your device is on the internet, um, there's a there's a great uh, web application called Shodan, which actually shows you your entire. Um, it shows it shows every device connected to the network, or excuse me, to the internet. Um, so, with that, you can just easily just put in a specific port and see, like, oh, this, I want to see all the devices that's on the internet that has uh, SMB. And if your network range is inside of that, might be in trouble, you might be vulnerable. So, what it similarly does is we look at the, how these are exploited, and not only do we um, are able to say what devices are vulnerable, but also um, which devices will be at risk. And one of the things that concerns me is the things that are left on. But we're going to yes. we're going to start talking about things that are left on uh, a little later in this. Let's go ahead and talk about one price specifically for a little bit. Uh, SMB is that sharing side of Windows, but it's not just Windows. It's also Linux. It's also Apple. And keep in mind, because this program was uh, it was a platform that had this side down, it wasn't it wasn't specific to, to Windows. So uh, what it was doing is it was looking for files. It was those are functions that almost any operating system can do. Uh, and because it was using a protocol that's shared from all manufacturers, it was easy to jump from machine to machine, which is interesting because usually you all are not used to a Linux machine infecting Windows, but this one did. So, uh, things that it was going after. 
all your documents, all your pictures, all your movies, all your database files, like the SQL that was running your DICOM and your HL7 that was based on XML, all that stuff in the way. That's bad. That shut down all of electronic health records and all of your imaging network. Everything comes to a grinding halt. Oh, well, also all of your encrypted files or compressed files. So um, I remember actually this was something that when I was going through my master's, one person uh, was talking about how his encryption was so strong that another instructor couldn't break it. And the other instructor looked at me and said, You're right, I can't break it. But after I'm done with it, neither will you. And that's the truth. <clears throat> so that sort of took that vindictive approach. And then you had to pay to decrypt it. So, help. We're sort of in over our heads, right? And so the big question is, well, how do we do this? Well, there's a couple of things I really want to encourage. First off, and you need to lean on OEMs on this one. They need to be a part of the solution. And I think to a lot of degrees, OEMs do want to be a part of the solution. However, the truth of the matter is, how much support you want to and effort you want to put into a machine that you've already bought, right? It's already been sold. And so it's going to be a conversation that we're going to have to have openly. Uh, and we don't want to cowboy it. We don't want to patch it and make changes to it. We do want to get into the purchasing process. But we do want to bring this to the attention. We take this presentation, bring it to the attention of the risk management. Do a pitch to them as to why you need to be more involved on the capital management. So, that's, that's one of the things that we do at Simly. So, uh, we help mitigate that risk um, to prevent different types of attacks. Okay. Uh, different, for different, not just one cry, but all of the types of attacks. So, uh, we look at how the device is connecting, what uh, files it's talking to. Uh, we also parse the protocols and see are there any strings that we have seen that are malicious. And so it's sort of good to have some uh, some more members on the team. Um, and I think that that's exactly the, the takeaway that I want you all to get. Start communicating with as many people and as many applicants as you want to try to mitigate this. So let's talk about some of the things that we recommend that we mitigate. And uh, this, I, I felt really good when I started talking to Chris. I showed him this slide. He's like, uh, "Yeah, this is this is the playbook, basically." Right? So right up at the top, I do want to let you know, you do need to put through patches. Now the bad thing about patches, especially Windows patches, Windows patches are not necessarily verified by your OEM. So you really have to be careful on this one, but at the same point in time, you really need these patches. So the, the thing about it is, is there's something called sandboxing. Sandboxing is where you take one of that item and put it off to the side, Take the uh, what's called a clone or a snapshot of the hard drive. If you don't know what I'm talking about, write down hard drive cloning. Uh, it means on a partition, you basically just look up another external drive, boot to a software, take a picture of the hard drive, save it. Then go through, do the updates, check the stability of the device. If the device is stable, fantastic. If the device is not stable, you're going to need to go back to that image and re pull it back. Okay. If you guys need any recommendations? If you guys need any recommendations on how to any tools pass this up? Come speak to me. This, this is fun. Uh, this, this, this is actually fun because this is one of those things where you get to you get to play around a little bit. Man. And I guess you know this is one of the things that I would encourage for you all. If you see this is playing well, that's good. That's good. So, uh, but I do want you to remember to keep the OEM in this loop. See where they're at. Talk to their their uh, quality insurance. Talk to their uh, test engineer and see where they're at. Um, next thing I'm going to tell you, Flash. We're going to talk about Flash. Uh, we'll talk about it in a separate uh, presentation. But basically, unless your device really needs a web browser running, you may want to figure out how to save that. Unless it really needs uh, you know, all of that uh, internet connectivity, you may want to isolate that. Yeah. So, um, you do want to, uh, you got something to add about that? Uh, that's one of the things that we do. So, per device, we give recommendations on how to uh, prevent different types of exploits. So, this device, 
the device doesn't need to be connected or have any internet access and just there it's on the network it's not going outbound then you can easily set that up on the device and that would help mitigate a lot of these things. Okay, fantastic. So uh, then there's also the port front facing USB ports. I think we've all heard that tale of the uh, the CT machine that was infected by someone charging their phone, right? Well, you know, there's no reason to leave that port live. You can actually get into the bias and you can disable it. Or physically, often you can just open up the cover, go to the front of that, and just physically disconnect that port. You know, a lot of times, if, if customers need a place to charge your phone, you can them wall up. But never forget that there have been proven situations where viruses have jumped, not just from phone to device, but from operating system to operating system. So you really have to be careful on this one, right? So just because the phone is, is, is isolated, you know, you don't know if they, there's a big trend of rooting your phone. And we were actually joking about how much of a, how much of a, a, a security risk that is. Okay, so next thing, we'll talk about some logins. Uh, we're also going to talk about GPO, that's your group policies. Uh, the GPO book for Windows is like 80 thick, it's like three inches thick, and it looks like a, like a wooden dictionary. But the truth of the matter is, that's all the settings in Windows. And you can just hold certain things, and this is something to ask the OEM, right? Ask them if I can do all of these things. Simple file sharing, unless you really need network connectivity, you just turn it off. And, and we'll go through that. We'll go through uh, talking about VPN, we'll talk about segmentation, we'll talk about the risk management, and then really, um, and this is something that was a huge takeaway for me from A 2017, the embedded version of bolt on security, we'll talk about those. Okay, so patches. I know we talked about these things. Yes, you do need extension patches, I love this bracket. So, um, the truth about it is, um, patches are extremely important for fixing things like uh, the heart leak problem that was uh, really big in, in uh, XP. Given enough time, people will find a vulnerability. There are vulnerabilities, for example, in Windows 7 and Windows 10 we have no idea about. We just haven't figured it out yet. Or someone hasn't figured it out and started squawking about it on YouTube, which is usually what they end up doing eventually. Right? So, and, and by the way, if you're not watching for that, you need to do that. You'll watch for how people would hack in this. So, um, watch out for automatic update. I think you all have policies for automatic update, especially in things like your surgical equipment. <laughs> Nothing like, hey, you require a reboot right now. I don't care if you need surgery. Yeah, you don't want that. So, watch out for automatic updates. Uh, keep in mind also, if you're not verifying with the OEM, they might have the you updated, you bought it. I don't know. The jury still out on substantive change. You know, they just had that uh, keynote speaker about that whole thing. This might fall into that gray area, so be careful on that. Uh, here's the big one we want to warn you about. Uh, so, Java, Flash, ASP are all different flavors, but essentially the same thing. What they are is basically an operating system environment that runs in a web browser. That's the best way. Is that a good way to put it? Simply? It gets your login's permission. Is that login an administrator? If that login's an administrator, you just gave Java access to your entire system. All of it. At your level. So you can probably see a vulnerability right there, right? ASP, Shockwave, all work the same way. In fact, actually, there's such a big problem that Google, if you haven't noticed, stopped using all of these things, literally just they, they came up with a new update to, uh, to HTML 5.2 that essentially embeds but isolates this thing, right? And so we're actually forcing everyone to update to that, and that's just the last year. So there's no way your medical devices are need on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, another, big, uh, another exploit vector is like web browsing stuff, right? So, you assume you're safe when you go to a website, or if it's a trusted website, you're okay. If it's kind of funky, maybe, maybe not. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with exploit kits, but uh, a lot of them have different types of um, exploit. They have a lot of exploits in them, but like Flash is one of the bigger ones. So by going to the website, um, what you do is just by going to the website, the website and the server knows 
uh, the IP address, it knows the operating system and the browser version. And if it's a lower version of your operating system, operating system is a specific one, they will say, okay, automatically execute this exploit and the device is already published, just like going to the website. So that's uh, basically a script kidding thing. That's, they're, they're basically, script kiddies are not writing their own software. They're basically using stuff posted uh, on the web. Those are the people you really need to watch out for. Way more of those people than actual hackers. Actual hackers, well, yeah, let like the pros handle <laughs> I mean, that's when you, when you think you've got something like that, that's that's a good uh, time to start communicating. But you do need to start figuring out what these kids that are laid up in the hospital beds and access to YouTube. You've got to figure out what they know. And the easiest way to do this is just literally go to YouTube and start looking on, um, well, how do I hack this? And I'm not kidding, there will be a lot of friendly videos with examples. Five minute videos. Yeah. Literally, if you can pause and download the software and type in these commands, you can do this to a network. And unfortunately, it's all under the guise of educational, right? So some of it's good, some of it's not so good. Yeah. But unfortunately, how do we learn? That's just how I learn. I don't know. No, that's, <laughs> that's one of the ways to learn. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly that. So just like researching and looking it up and like realizing you can do this and this. And then step back and you're like, that was easy. I did this, this is amazing. And then you have a few seconds and then you can't you're like this is really easy. How do I secure my own self? So you need to be more aware this way. The real panic for me was that was easy. Was that correct? Alright, so <laughs> so anyway, um, the uh, front face we just need more to talk about this. I want to remind you about the phone, uh, the uh, the story. We had a virus that was up in uh, I want to say somewhere in Dallas, I won't think on anyone. That. Uh, they kept having a CT machine going down, went up there uh, you know, during the time that sat during this one shift where it was always happening, and the guy watched the technician or the technologist plug their uh, USB charger into that and plug up their phone. The problem was their phone was rooted, it was infected with the virus. It was running essentially a version of Linux because it's it's, app, uh, it's Android. Android is Linux. The CT machine is Linux. Same operating system. Virus saw a new operating system started reaching out to it. And hey, guess what? I can infect this one too. And, uh, one thing. So um, there's specific departments in the DO or different areas of the DoD where they don't allow for USB to be plugged in. Mm -hmm. uh, you can plug a USB in and it will be set up as uh, storage, but there are some USBs that you can configure um, so it actually acts as a, uh, a keyboard. So as soon as you, it, it, the computer thinks it's a keyboard, so as soon as, and you pre script it as well. So as soon as you plug it in, uh, it acts as a keyboard, it starts executing a script, and your phone immediately it just has a call out back to the website, and then you're, you're messed up. That's evil. It's malicious. That's evil. You know what's evil about that? I have no idea they were doing that, by the way. Uh, what's evil about that is you can plug things up to your USB port, like a keyboard, right? It goes through and it says install the device, right? What it did is it looked for the DXE command. It looked for an executable. It started running the software on that device automatically. vicious. Moving on. So, uh, track sense of hardware. This should be a sort of a no-doubt, but I do want to remind you that 15% uh, of the breaches they're about is uh, people not securing hardware. Leaving it out, leaving it open, people taking it. Now, if I may, this is 15% of reported HIPAA breaches. That means that not only was the device taken, the device was taken and eventually ended up in the hands of somebody whose intent was to do something bad to the hospital. That means that there's a lot more that are taken. So just keep sensitive information down. Please let people uh, know. They've got to keep track of things. I really recommend that you know where your vulnerabilities are. And I'm, I'm a little ahead of myself, so I think we're going to go on to the next slide here. We'll go on to that. Okay, so security measures. I'm going to tell you right now, passwords are hugely exploited. So I really recommend using things like uh, uh, Meet Seek and Camel Case. Camel Case is where you change the, uh, the uh, front 
letter of each word to be capitalized so that you can tell where each word uh, you put together. And I've merged together multiple words into one sentence, is, and that becomes a password. Notice I've also replaced the E with the three and the A with the at, and uh, but the, uh, the L is now, it looks like a one. But, uh, you know, just have a policy for creating strong passwords. And you really do need to have that. Now, to, this will help with up to 35% of the breaches are email. Frankly, email is just, you know, I like to say, it's just the flag waving out there in the breeze. Anyone can see it. Anyone can do anything to it. So the weaker the password, the easier it is to get into it. Right? Yeah. And so that's one of the things that, uh, that uh, you need to be alert to is password strength. I also want to remind you that security is generally the three things I got at the bottom. Uh, there's something that you have, something you know, and something you are. Something you have is something like a father or an ID. Something you know is a password or username or personal information. Something you are is the virus uh, recognition, the facial recognition, voice recognition, phone code recognition. I'm not going to get into tipping people. Here's why this phone can do all those things. Right? We've got phones that even have SPO2 sensors. You ever notice that? Have anyone seen that? It's sort of cool, right? But think of it this way. You can uh, verify a lot of biometric data at that point in time. You want to talk about this? It's a pretty big subject, actually. Yeah, so um, as far as, so there was a case uh, where an officer pulled somebody over, um, and then they said they he was trying to get some information, and what he did was his phone was locked, and uh, as the police had it, He's, he pulled it up to the person's face because the iPhones have facial recognition uh, to unlock the phone. Pulled it up, it unlocked, and then they gathered all the information that they needed to build a case against that individual. I've turned off my facial recognition because I don't want uh, law enforcement to be able to use information on my phone against me. <laughs> I don't have information on my phone that they can use against me. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I'm sorry, that was a little bit of a chat with Chris or the Okay, so the, the truth of the matter is, yeah, you're going to do more and more logins with your phone. If anyone had a situation where you had logging to something recently, like in the last six months, and you know this change to Google, to, to Microsoft, to Yahoo, where now you have to verify on your phone that yes, you are the person trying to log in. Get used to that. Get used to more of that. Get used to that integrating with some of these biometrics so that we can get two or three of these layers. If you want to get all three, if you can, but two would be great. If I can get two, you are who you say you are. And think about it. You have a key, right? You have an ID, probably has an RF in it. You have a, uh, a login and a password information, so you probably have different keys. And this again, it's about not being the lowest hanging fruit. So if I have to do multiple ways to hack you, if I have to use, uh, if I have a gesture to press a button on your phone to authenticate, as well as get your password, it's way more difficult than if I just have your password. Um, and it's uh, probably a good time to remind you to not always use the same password. Uh, database, databases get hacked, they get breached. So if you have your email associated with the password on any website and it's the same one, if that database gets hacked, they can get your password. And then, uh, and there are some people that just have a cumulative, all these databases that have all been hacked, and then they just have to punch in uh, an email and say, yeah, I got this person's email, this is their password, here you go. And it is sold on the dark net. Yeah, um, there are, we really, we really do need a full line. Uh, so uh, there are full you know, downloads for password lists, uh, selling so, yes. a million uh, passwords put together. So not just things that appear in the English language, but things that appear in virtually all languages. They also messed around with the order of it. So, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with going and downloading the list because I can guarantee YouTube tells you where to go, right? Get a list and just make sure your passwords are on any of those lists that are flagging out there. Please. Let's go on to the next one here. I don't know how we're doing on time. Okay, so um, authentication versus authorization. I do want to talk about this briefly. This is something that's going to be in certifications if you get it. 
So authentication is you are the person that you say you are. That was the previous screen. Authorization is you are not allowed to or you are allowed to do this stuff. Right? So just because you are who you say you are doesn't mean you should be able to do anything that you want. So it's, you know, see this, this is the login, this is the person, this is what you can do. Right? And so that's a really important thing to, to, to control. Um, this is one of the better ways to control it. So uh, GPO will set a uh, policy for it. This is what happens to all users. This is what happens specifically to these users. Uh, these are all the settings for Windows. Now, I don't expect you to be a pro on that dictionary thick book. I just expect you to know to ask. So know to ask your uh, OEM when they're setting things up. Hey, what are the group uh, GPOs? Blah, blah, blah. Don't you think you got it? Could you get a hold of somebody in your corporate before this thing goes online and figure out what are the GPOs? How are you uh, locking this thing down? Right? And so this is one of those questions you want to start asking people about. And be alert that this is an option. Right? So another thing that we, I would say is an option is you know the networking. Do we absolutely need to have that Windows turned on? Do we need to have that SME that was exploited and off? Start asking yourself, do I need to turn these things on? This gets into the concept of firewall at this point. We're telling the operating system what it can and cannot do, what it should or should not do. And we're just disabling this. This big thing is something called simple file sharing. Simple file sharing is the difference between I'm not going to respond to, hey, everybody, right? You know, we're supposed to wake up, laugh at that. I think, I, I think I'm putting you to sleep. I apologize about that. We can go on to some stuff that's a little bit more humorous, I guess. But uh, this is really the big exploit. This is one of those things that I try to take advantage of. So another thing that I want you to start asking, this is not going to make a friend out of people. What is your policy on your VPN access? Do you know? Do you have any control over your VPN? I've got one guy over there going, yeah, I do. Why? Because we've got a purge on VPN access. How often do your servicers have turnover? How many of those people that had turnover, it wasn't on the best of uh, terms? Do they still have access to your network? That might be a question you want to ask, right? So figure out who has access to your VPNs. How often are these uh, access to these logins purged? Ask your IT department. This is actually your internal IT department that's setting this thing up. But they are setting this up with the OEM. Keep in mind, if you cut your OEM out of servicing some things, it might affect your environment of care, and it might also sour your relationship with that OEM. So communicate with them. Hey, I just want to let you know, we are changing our policies on the uh, access of VPN. We are going to institute a, I don't know, a, a biannual purge or something like that. So every six months, if you still need VPN access, you know, please let me know. Something like that would be a great, a great option. And then all your devices should be in a VPN. If they're not, that should be a red flag. Um, I mentioned Shogun earlier, but I, I personally like scan the internet just to see um, what devices that RDP needs remote desktop protocol. Um, just to see what was out there. And I was amazed at some of the, the locations. So I, I also had like to deal with okay, where is this located? Um, Explain them where they seek RDP. Like, like when you're getting things serviced. Yeah, okay, RDP is when you're getting things serviced by a manufacturer, or let's say you're at home and you cannot figure out something on your computer and you call Dell. And Dell said, okay, I'm going to give you this code. I need you to go to this website, or I need you to fire this software up, and I need you to enter this code so that I can have access to your machine. That's what RPC is, essentially. So you're getting remote access. And I really want to stress it. I did not stress it. Uh, VPN is remote access. So people are accessing your network from the internet, which your manufacturers have to do. Otherwise, you know, look, you're going to be waiting five hours for that service engineer for that CD for them to do 15 minutes of work because you've got something backlog in the queue and all they gotta do is kick it and get it to run, right? Which they can do through command line. 
So an RD, remember the software was fine and it's going through the VPN, but it's not, again, a red flag. Uh, one of the places that I saw that had RDP like the remote next to the computer, it was like a correctional facility. And I was like, really? Like, a prison? Like, I should not be able to, nobody should be able to connect from this one at all. And they were just out there. Clapping the breeze, man. Right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the next one. I think you know, ask about that. Uh, network segmentation. Now, those of you that attended that uh, other uh, presentation that I had the other day, you were probably a little bit more familiar with this. We have a graphic here that shows you roughly how a hospital is designed. Uh, you have a front end. The top is actually where it says internet, and there's a little lightning bolt. And then you'll notice I've got something called the DMZ, which is basically the uh, the front end of the hospital. The VPN is on the front end, and then it puts a foot on the back end and controls access between the two. Right? So anyone who's coming in the front end can see the VPN. They can also see their web service. If your hospital has a web page, if your hospital doesn't have a web page, you probably have no patients. Right? And, and I'm just saying everyone sort of expects that you have this stuff. So the truth of the matter is, once they get past that VPN, they're on the inside. Now we do put things in there so that to slow them down. That's what those little brick walls are, those are firewalls. They are looking at traffic going back and forth. We do have another thing called an intrusion detection system. We'll have to bore you with all the details, but spend a little bit of time studying those details. Get familiar with graphics like this so that you can follow the basic concept of the network. Do you have this somewhere in your environment shop? Do you have a list of ranges of IPs? This department is using these machines that should have these IPs. Why don't you? It's just a matter of sitting down and documenting. And by the way, that's like a third of our job, right? So uh, I really also want you to know about who you're using for cloud applications. You don't have to be careful on cloud applications. The biggest thing that scares me about that is who owns it. See, if it's all your medical records are stored in Epic. Are they your records, the patient's records, or Epic's records? What ones are which? It's sort of nice to know that, you know? So spend a little bit of time understanding how the policies are for the storage of your radiology stuff and the storage of your medical records. And more and more, hospitals are doing this stuff off-site through contract with somebody like Chris than, uh, than you know, having it in-house. Because let's be honest, that person who's doing it all the time is far better to handle it, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you shameless boy now, right? <laughs> oh, okay, let's go back. So, uh, you know, what it simply does is we give you insight into your own network, so we show you all the devices that are there, how they're connected, the utilization of all those devices, uh, risk, so the risk of the network has some cash mitigation. So, one thing you also do for this is network segmentation. So, in the event where you have a device and um, you want to separate the network or it's doing something malicious or might be doing something malicious, you can easily do that. So I see a question. Uh, yeah, you have a question, sir? Yeah, well, our, um, you know, network segmentation is good. Yes. The problem is uh, you can be cross traffic. So I mean, we're going to look at a lot of applying an ACL. Access control bullets and external uh, button on your TV. So, like, uh, we'll have like a payment on the data for you to apply. That's our imaging team, so our imaging equipment is all on there. And of course, you know, from the imaging device, you're talking to your back, you're talking to the data workers, you're talking to your back of the back. Then you get into some of the smaller devices that are down at that more local level, and we're still moving down there. And the reason we're doing that is because if, if, if somebody's been to a CT, I don't want them infecting right. something else, you know, three rooms down that doesn't walk in that CT. Okay, so the comment was on that for those people who are going to listen to this was uh, access control this, utilizing access control this, uh, beyond just a uh, simple segmentation. Uh, segmentation does control data flow well. Uh, but yeah, there's there's other implementation techniques that uh, that are out there, I mean, uh, filters yeah. essentially that you can use to make sure that uh, certain machines are talking to certain machines, and I think that's what you're, what you're talking about. Yeah, basically, 
please come see me afterwards and talk more about this. Okay, so moving along, let's talk about bolted on security. I wish I could find the gentleman's name, but God, he had a great presentation on this. There's a difference between it was meant to be secure, and I just grabbed a bunch of stuff and slapped it together, and it looks pretty cool, right? And so there's a difference between uh, I built security from the get go, and this thing is a tank. And, or, oh, uh, we, we need uh, an antivirus scanner, so I'm just going to find something I'm going to slap on in here, right? And that's the difference between bolt on security. And that's a question we need to start asking on the OEM. What type of security stuff is embedded? What do you mean? The answer is, well, what do you mean? You might want to bring that up in your capital you know, asset management uh, meetings because that's not the answer we want. The, the answer we want is, well, oh, we've talked about this, we've talked about this, and we've done this, and the system has this, and this, and this. And, you know, they should have that right off. And that's the difference between it is designed to be secure versus we're doing security as a cap. And that's definitely questions you want to bring up. Okay. So five ten k. You know what we just we just talked about uh, earlier this morning. And this I did this independent. I did not know what they were going to talk about in the keynote. Uh, they were talking about you know five ten k process. You know, does it affect it to do bolt on security? You know, if you're throwing a uh, a patch into your antivirus, no, you can go ahead and patch. Them. But if you're throwing new antivirus into that operating system, yeah, you're in that gray area now, right? And so you want to watch out for where that line is, and you don't want to have to step over it. Keep that in mind, okay? Um, now, this is a really important slide. I saw a lot of you taking pictures. I recommend you take a picture of this one, because this is really sort of a how-to. Okay, so first thing I really need you to do is start writing things down. See this as an asset management issue. And by the way, that is, I want to remind you, third of our job, we do risk management. We know where the risks are, right? So start adding risk metrics to your risk assessments, right? Like our network metrics to your risk assessments. That's sort of what I wanted to say. So, uh, know where your vulnerable machines are. A great person can ask me a question. They said, hey, if you're going to have an attack today, do you know where your most vulnerable machines are? Do you know where your machines that are running XP are? If I were going to put something up on the news and say, Windows 8 is getting hacked, and it's just Windows 8, where are those machines in your hospital? You see what I'm saying? And so you need to know that stuff. What's the best that to know what a patch is? Yes. Right came out that we had uh, certain GPL percentages, but they had a certain, they had XP, they had vertical stuff, they had certain patch levels, and yep. they weren't affected. Right? And that doesn't have to do with these great times, but I'll find out what's on what machine. Fourth bullet down on the second session uh, patches. You want to make sure that you know what patches and software you're using. You want to know what your security patch, uh, packs are. You want to know all of this material, and there's a lot of it. And unfortunately, every time you do an update, it's going to need to be updated because it changes. And that's exactly what we do as so it's, it's risk management. So we help you uh, mitigate a lot of this risk. As as the gentleman was saying, you need to know what devices um, are vulnerable, and we provide recommendations on how to do it without patching. As well as if you need to have. So, um, yeah, what do you think you do now? I've got a little bit of a train of thought. Uh, new purchases, I really want you to get active on that. And you all should be taking this presentation and bringing it to your risk manager and making sure they understand the importance of your role in capital asset management. To make sure that they understand that you're the person who's hopefully going to look at. At all these little things when the machine is being purchased, right? And so I know there's a lot of dot dot here. This is like uh, DICOM and conformance statements. Anyone who's in conformance statements, right? You know that there, there are 70 page headaches, and you're supposed to compare every one of them from 
every other one with every new purchase, like anyone's doing that, right? The truth of the matter is that in the ideal world, we are doing that, right? And so that's where I really would like you to all to be able to get uh, on board on this. And remember, you know, just don't shy away from hard questions. Ask the hard questions. So uh, this is something that I would like you to show you if you have risk management and they say, no, no dice. This is a list or a partial list of the breaches that were listed on uh, the uh, federal HIPAA uh, website for just February 2019. Just a couple months ago. There were 29 breaches, 25 of them were unauthorized access or labeled hacking, but it had to do with access. Uh, four of them were uh, from theft of devices, 14 of them were direct server hacks. Right? Eight of them direct email attacks. The number of hacks at 14 was up from the last time it did an update, which was May 2017. I think I probably should have done that annually. But that's a 50 percent increase in two years. There were two million patient records affected. That's a bad trend. You know? The information can be found on the link that's right below there. This is uh, something that's listed. You know, these not hospitals that wanted to list it. I didn't clip off the name of the hospitals to protect the innocent, so to say. You can go on there and look for yourself. Show people that. Unfortunately, none of us want to be on that list, do we? So, what we're required to be if you're reporting issues. On the plus side, we are having an open conversation. And that's a good thing. But we need to mitigate these risks. So, is the sky falling? No, the sky is not falling. Are we the last line of defense? No, we're the first line of defense. You're just the coordinator. That's where they're calling us uh, health technology management now. Right? So if we do not have the ability to handle it in-house, do not shy away from calling people like the assembly or other people, the OEMs, or any of these people. Just try to get the stuff going. Right? Um, remember that the OEMs do support this stuff. Uh, the, the big question is how much effort are they going to put into something they've already sold? And that's a great question to ask them. Right? And so uh, we're just trying to encourage people to use good techniques that you're already using to minimize the risks. And that's really what we're after. So I do have some questions uh, for you all, and this might involve me taking the mic around so that we can actually put this in if anyone wants to be on recording. So um, how do you react to, to cyber attacks? You know, do you want to talk about any of the ransomware stuff? Um, you know, how do you handle sandboxing? That's a great one. You know, do you do sandboxing? Do you pull something off the side and put it in this little playground? You know, I love the analogy, by the way. If the kid throws the sand everywhere, it doesn't matter. You just scoop it up, put it back in. You said it. It's okay, right? And so, uh, you know, you, you mentioned following operating systems and making sure that you're following the versions and you know which versions. Wow, so you actually do the bit of the intrusion test by the test. Or if we have a mobile device, I know the
go. It's a long process to get through. That's all right. That's been done. And it makes them feel more comfortable. And it gives us a chance to screen the equipment. Yeah. yeah. I, I like what you're doing with the with the actual doing of the intrusion uh, test. I mean, that's a really important part about it. Hopefully, you all have an IT team that has a security specialist on it that will do some things, just some basic stuff, you know, just running up, uh, running backtracks. Can I break into it? You know, how vulnerable are things? And there again, I do want to encourage you all with the cooperation of your IT and your OEM, don't really step on toes, but ask them, hey, can I get involved in this project? Can I get involved with this? Can we figure out, uh, play around a little with this? It will allow you to really be uh, a little bit better prepared. You know, sir, I'm just going to take the mic to you at this point because it's, it's good. Uh, we've got a lot to say when we're going out here. So, yes, sir. My running that rapid seven test before the device comes in is working a lot different. Because we can set it up to run uh, its own post generic password. You know, admin, capital letters, admin, capital A, admin, you know, admin, and all that stuff. And what we found out is, is that with some equipment, we tried to go against it a couple of times. It was fine, it was six, it was a lot of the equipment out. So we're finding out some of those things ahead of time about because sometimes you go into a piece of equipment and it's locked up, it's like, oh, that the user must have tried the wrong password a couple of times. It might not have been the user, it could have been somebody that got into the system and was hit it from the backside trying to access the <laughs> So we're learning a lot when we run these rapid settings. We actually run a scan in every model that we have, and we have it in the database. And our hope is that the law really comes up and says that uh, for 237, vulnerable to the XYZ part, we'll be able to look at that and see which one of our devices has port 237 wide open so that we don't have to try and search around and call vendors up and find which 237 is 237 open. You know, we're able to really just identify the list and isolate it. If I can, I do want to clarify some things uh, that port was a software port, so the IP then colon in the software port. It, it's how the, the operating system identifies software on the uh, piece of equipment. So uh, it's very important to understand the basics on, on uh, TCP IP, and that's, that's definitely a good illustration of that. Yes, who else wants to talk about this? Okay, yeah. here, here you go, Chris. So I do think it's terrific that you guys have to stay advice uh, before they come on the network. That's huge. And getting that information about the device uh, prior to having anything on your network is critical. Um, one of the things that we do is we do passive scanning. So once that device is on your network, uh, we, we let you know if a port has been open. Because there are some cases where, and it's, you can do it on any device where you actually set up and create an open ports. So while the testing you, did, you do in the beginning, uh, the port might uh, not be open. Later it could be. So we passively scan and we just see if anything that you could say, it, if you did get that case where like, oh, this port is affected by a virus C, or now we're at X. Uh, you can say, okay, what are my devices, which ports are open, what are all these devices, you know exactly which ones. And I, I don't know about some of the basic tools that you uh, work with, but one of the ones I would use is NetScan. Uh, NetScan is a, a good uh, a tool to do that with, and uh, just see what's, what's out there. You know? Because uh, to be honest, yeah, we represent a, a target box. But uh, one of the things that I told you when we were first uh, going through this, the thing that really scares me is I don't think that the uh, people who are malicious intent have really figured out the value of, uh, of patient records. And uh, what scares me is them actually figuring that out. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hold on. Oh, I, there again, I'm doing now. I'm the very screen. Yes. Okay, so. Okay, I have a comment in relation to what you were saying, what you all were talking about, about running the scan. Um, this is regarding to a banking system that I just uh, encountered uh, the other last week. Uh, the credit union, I'm not sure if they've had a breach or something, they decided to update their, uh, 
the banking system online. And so I was trying to access my account and it indicated that I, I needed to put my password in for us and I was doing that were saying that I they needed to further identify me. And so in doing so I had to get the verification and, and, and a lot of people they don't pay attention and they're trying to do phone verification. You really have to make sure that the information is correct on that. What I noticed is that there was a different phone number there that I know that had nothing to do with me. I've had the same phone number for years. And so I kept looking and I went out of the system, come back into the system just to make sure it was asking that same phone number was there. I'm like, okay, so my thought at this point was to call the bank itself yes. because it could have been someone on the back end, like you're saying, waiting for me to send that verification, not paying attention, and then now they have access. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's actually a new, a new line of identity theft. One of the most creative things I think anyone's ever done. And this, they haven't done this yet for hospital, but I guess we should be on the word to this possibility. But uh, one of the things they are doing for banks is uh, you'll show up and, and try and act as your account, but you're not that person. Well, we know that person. That person was just in. They had an ID and everything. You're not that person. What they literally did was assume you. Lock your account away from you, and you're no longer you. And uh, yeah, hackers are really looking at that power. What the hospital bill or doctor bill Yeah, and your and your observation is really important. Is that yeah, there is a, a huge financial. Uh, incentive, that's one of the three big motivators. Another motivator is uh, the challenge, can I do it? Which I think drives about a third of them. And then another third of them are, but, well, that's not even a third, maybe it's a smaller percentage, are disgruntled. And uh, they do the, well, if I can't have it, no one can. Uh, and they're, they're, they're malicious in, in intent from that perspective. But yeah, I would say the lion's share of people are looking for a quick and easy payout. And that's what really concerns me about network security and hospitals is the value of the protected health information and the fact that the laws have been uh, made so that there's a punitive, right? And we have that situation where we have an obligation now to protect something and there's a punitive to us if we don't. And when they figure that out, they'll force us into that. And there's a there's a way to exploit people. And that's a bad thing. I mean, who would ever thought when Facebook was firing up the value of your opinions on things? Who would have ever thought that you could sell that for hundreds of dollars for each user times a billion? You know? Apparently a you know, somewhat hacker that lived in uh, what, MIT. Yeah. So. Is there any other uh, questions? Chris, you got anything to add? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you get the mic now. <laughs> so uh, I did want to harp on the importance of working with OEMs. I'm probably one of the few representatives from an OEM that's here at this expo. And we're more than willing to work with hospitals and third party companies. Uh, for example, we're all in the business of taking care of the customer, right? Well, uh, hospital network went to change over from a vital tax to agri tax and that required change to be addresses. We presented the hospital organization with a quote for the work that it covered. They decided it was too expensive to work with third party companies and they completely botched everything, which had me going in and spending a good two weeks touching every system again. And it goes the same way for security. If you're going to log into any of our systems, it really helps if you give us a call, just like a service call, that we can work together. It won't be built, and it'll make sure everyone's on the same page at all times. Uh, and that brings us back to this morning's keynote, which is you know, the altruistic versus the, uh, the financial. And uh, we, we, we have that, you know, let's be honest, uh, you can't look me in the face and tell me your hospital's not a business. You know, your hospital is a business, and we, we understand that, but at the, at the bottom, uh, of this, uh, the the big rallying cry really is we are on the same team, and I think that 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 is the spirit of this. Hopefully, I've ever been able to reflect that. Sir, you got something to have your thoughts on? Are we? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Any other questions? Um, yes. yes, sir. Thank you so much.